Hello conservationists. Uh, today we have a tour of the Cimarron National Grasslands. Uh, this is a grassland that is managed by the USDA Forest Service and it's located in southwest Kansas in Morton County and Stevens County in the far southwest corner of Kansas. Uh, this area was the heart of the Dust Bowl uh, back in the 30s and uh, because of that uh, this area was uh, sort of designated to become a grassland mainly just to stabilize the soils uh, and prevent uh, more dust storms from uh, from being worse than they already were. Uh, so we're trying to stabilize the soil and uh, basically return all this uh, farmland that had been converted to wheat production uh, back into grasslands. Uh, so during our trip we had kind of an interesting environment uh, because uh, for one that area had been in an extreme drought. Uh, this was in May of 2022. And it had been in an extreme drought and they hadn't had more than a quarter inch of rain since August of the previous year. So almost a full year without any rain to speak of. Uh, so it was extremely dry when we were there. Uh, also, uh, there were some fires, uh, some pretty major fires in New Mexico. And the smoke from those fires were uh, blowing over this part of Kansas during our, our trip. And it made for kind of an eerie environment while we were there. Uh, our tour was led by uh, Jeff Althier, uh, who was the acting Cimarron National Grasslands District Ranger. And he's in charge of managing these grasslands and the crews that work on it. Um, and we were also joined by Tom Roth, who's a retired state agronomist uh, for the NRCS in Kansas. And he now uh, runs his own uh, consulting company. Uh, but we uh, went down to visit the site to get a feel for uh, what the grasslands are like and uh, what things have been done over the years to try to, to stabilize these uh, vulnerable soils and uh, keep, keep them from blowing away. Uh, these grasslands, uh, again, were managed to keep soils from blowing, uh, but they also helped to preserve the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, so the Santa Fe Trail was a very busy uh, point of commerce for uh, for the southwest uh, for a long, long time. And there's many highways that more or less parallel the South uh, Santa Fe Trail today. Uh, so there's markers and in a, in a, you can actually see the trail uh, in the park uh, to this day. Uh, and so they're preserving some of the history at this site. Uh, but also another piece of history that was preserved is the uh, Tunerville Work Center. So the Tunerville Work Center was established uh, mainly as a headquarters for a research station that, uh, that was being used to try to figure out what plants could actually grow in these sandy soils in the semi-arid west uh, so, that could, so they could actually revegetate these sites and prevent them from blowing. So um, I'm not sure if it was part of the CCA or the Works Progress Administration uh, to, to have a bunch of workers there, uh, but they had uh, over 100 people that were working on the site and uh, the site got its name from uh, apparently a cartoon that was popular uh, at the time called the Tunerville Trolley. And uh, and they had, I guess, a bus that would haul people up to this uh, from town into this workstation uh, where they would work on uh, planting trees for windbreaks and, and uh, seeding grass and so on. Uh, but this, uh, this work center is still used today. It's the active headquarters for the grasslands. And I, uh, you'll see some of the original equipment from the site. Um, and you'll also see some of the more modern equipment that they're using as well. Uh, but the site is still in use and they're still doing everything they can to keep the site from blowing. Uh, but the mission has changed a little bit. It's more or less stabilized, uh, but now they're managing the grasslands for uh, cattle grazing, uh, for oil production, uh, recreation, habitat, and lots of other uh, land uses. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this tour. Uh, and want to give a shout out and a thanks to uh, Jeff Althier and, and uh, Tom Roth for their help with this tour. So uh, sit back and enjoy. Uh, and if you ever have a chance to get to the Cimarron National Grasslands, I highly encourage you to do so. So yeah, in 1937 was the Bankhead Jones Act. That kind of finalized you know, making this public domain, but there were a lot of other relief acts before that that started in 33, roughly, you know, so that the government was coming in and buying some of this ground that had been going away in the Dust Bowl, basically. So yeah. the Bankhead Jones Act kind of finalized it all, and it went actually to the Farm Service Administration first, and then 
just a year later, they turned it over to the Soil Conservation Service. And that's probably when the big time restoration started. You know, when they purchased this and built these facilities here at Tunerville. Um, that's probably when the big crews of CCC folks came in and they started doing a lot of restoration, probably mostly just seeding, I would guess. Would you guess? Yeah, so they probably, I mean, I'm thinking that, you know, initially there was, the main thrust was trying to figure out how to get that seed into the ground and, on, in, in a, in a large there. area. <laughs> yeah. Because if you think about it, like a lot of these seeds, barely what you really want is just it's barely into the soil yeah. it's almost laying on top of the ground yeah. um, and so this particular drill you know they've got a, a, a box of the boxes up here on the front which you can even still see the agitators in here so the agitators would keep that seed um, from bridging over and so as these agitators move, you know, the seed would feed down into the seed cups and then into the tubes. And then for the, the large, some larger seeds or, you know, probably either seeds or forb seed, yeah. you know, the forb seed would go into these cans back here. <clears throat> and you can still see, like on the back side of here, the tube that's running down yep here and then you know there would be a probably a, a a metal tube that went down here and then that would be where the seed would drop and you can even see the the clutch you know kind of system here that oh, they yeah. use to speed up and slow oh, down yeah. the the seeding rates yeah. which is really kind of amazing and so you know they they could do multiple species seedings with this type of drill. Yeah. That was kind of the goal too, right? Is trying to find what species they can actually get. <laughs> Except they just want to get something growing on the landscape so that uh, yeah, they just stop something growing. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Try to so keep, to keep the soil, different... what soil's left here, yeah. here. Yeah. Trying different tree species for, for windbreaks and, and different grass species. Right. So, but they did all their own maintenance work and that kind of stuff. There was a blacksmith shop here. So they were probably forging a lot of these. If they busted a gear, they put them over there and actually just build them. Yeah. So. They probably didn't have any choice either. No, so that's it, had to. Far away from anywhere. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like a month, we had to order a Right. Well, that's even if you could, I mean, you were, we're in the height of the depression at that, <laughs> still in the depression at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So just trying to find maybe just the steel to forge these, you know, they may have gone out and looked for scrap or something yeah. that, so that they could build that. Yeah. Well, and we'll go down further on the river, you know, where some of the old steam tractors were found, mm -hmm. you know, cause once they, once those steam tractors quit working, they used them as erosion control devices down on the sim, and they just started fight when the Cimarron would flood, it exposed these old steam tractors. <laughs> Well, that's not much so, different than even in the central part of the state, they used cars. Yeah, right. No, yeah, they, they just dump a, dump a dump bunch of cars car along a, a creek bank and to it stabilize it. Yeah. it. And, <laughs> call it. But you can see, you know, there's kind of the progression of cedars over here. Well, yeah, yeah. we can walk up and talk about those different ones up there. How, you know, this is maybe the Model T, and then we move <laughs> yeah. on yeah. up to the... To, it looks like almost an old Truax. Up yeah. There. But yeah. there's a Horizon. There's an old Horizon grass drill up there. Should we go walk by him real quick? Sure. Yep. Yeah, and this occurred after kind of the Industrial Revolution started, so the mules weren't <laughs> a big player. <laughs> And so once again, you know, we have, you see on this one too, where it has an agitator to keep that 
fluffy like your big blue stem or your sand blue stem and keep that so that it doesn't just bridge over and so that it keeps feeding down into the seed tubes. And this one's still actually got the tubes, tubes on it. Yep. And then <laughs> nobody's used it That's in a while. Okay. And then here's your yep. fine, your really like round, fine yep. seed would go in here. And then they both drop down, and then here's your, you know, how you make your adjustments on the grass drill that would open and close the slots down here. And then this, I'm guessing, is a true, oh, well, it's a, So this is a layered, and that's actually one I've never heard of. Uh, yeah. It looks a lot like a true axe. Yep. Yeah. Color and everything. Yep. That's what I was yellow. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but you know, again, it's the same concept. You can divide the your seed yeah. so that it doesn't. But it's like you, everything. Not just well, and when you put, say, like you were to mix switchgrass and uh, sand blue stem together. Your switchgrass is going to come out first, yeah, because the just the bouncing and stuff it'll settle down. And so, yeah. <laughs> but you'd put your switchgrass here and your sand blue stem here, and so they feed out right. at the and drop into the tube. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see any. Well, and so we got there's an old is this an old chisel? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Tractor seat. And that's not having been here terribly long. You know, I see them to this day still. Well, that's the what I mean. The vines blow off <clears throat> and they start doing this chiseling. So this you would use for emergency wind erosion control. Yeah. And the idea is there's a chisel and there's a shank on it. And you hopefully have enough moisture so you can pull some clods up. Oh, okay. And then because you've got a roughened soil surface, it, that erosion taking place right at the soil surface is decreased. Yep. And so they use these for emergency and they're tillage. And still doing it Well, today. <laughs> and so we were, yesterday had gone out the, of the, the grasslands area and went past a couple of fields that had been chiseled. Yep. Yeah. And so- well, It was definitely moving there. Yeah. You know, exactly. they, they still use the same type, same, similar equipment today to try and um, Slow reduce the, the wind erosion. <laughs> right. So, yeah, today, I mean, we obviously still use it. You know, it's for managing everything they used to. We do have a little more recreation that goes on, being that it's you know, the largest public land tract in Kansas. Yeah. So, you know, we base everything out of here, our fire program, we do some prescribed fire. We burned about 1,600 acres this year. We're always trying to think of what historically would have burned, and I don't know if that's even possible, but we'd like to get up to just maybe about 5,000 acres a year, okay. reintroducing fire, you know, and how does it affect things. Um, you know, I, I've got a big question in my mind is just what, you know, the lesser prairie chicken numbers are dropping. Would fire help that? I don't know. I, you know, some of the questions I have. Cause you know, we're just so vastly more stable than we were, but the chickens made it through all that. Yeah. The thirties and the everything else. And mm -hmm. now they're struggling. And in my mind, the country looks better than it ever did. <laughs> but. Yeah, the question I had <laughs> going here is like, 
I really have no sort of reference point for like what it would have looked like like pre settlement. Yeah, and that would be. And, yeah, what's what's this grassland like? What what its native what's what its native uh, situation? Yeah, what it's and is it you know how we've always used these climax communities and stuff or what we consider climax communities? You know, mm -hmm. nature's really just a big circle that we're somewhere on a point. They don't. Nature doesn't yeah. care, <laughs> but you know, sand sage is this still part of the recovery process? You know, um, you can see, look right out here into our horse pasture, and you can see where we've treated the sand sage. Yeah, well, that's what I was going <laughs> to ask you. So, did, was that mechanical? That was probably chemical. Uh, chemical, yeah. And across the highway, there's some big patches of it. You know mm -hmm. where. I think the sand sage was a major player in the restoration work. And then, you know, as our values change, you know, do we want as much sand sage? Well, at one point, the grasslands were just, well, they're here, for, it's here for grazing. That was the number one thing. And it's still a big part of what we do, but that's not everything. So they were, oh, we got to get rid of sand sage now. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and it, I don't know, you know, that's, there's still a lot of questions. I mean, that country's obviously stable on either side of that line. So what do you guys use to manage the, the salt cedar? We do, we found out pulling them works the best. Okay. Yeah, actually with as big a equipment as we can find yeah. and pull them. And then after about three years, you may get some little regrowth and we'll come back and chemically treat them. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we do some just straight chemical treatment, and then we're going to try to push some big, heavy stands here pretty quick with a dozer just to see, you know, not on a big scale, but just to see what kind of luck we have. So similar to like what they do maybe in South Texas with the mesquite where they're going in and cabling. Yeah. Kind of for yeah. like it's, but you're just going to use it, the blade on the on dozer. The dozer. Yeah, it. on just some smaller patches of real heavy stuff just to kind of see I'm sure we're gonna have to come back and do some chemical treatment at some point but you know just some we've seen so far that the most effective and long term is wait till there's a little moisture and pull it and then in about two three years come back and treat any re-sprout you get which is very little. Are there any other invasive species you guys have to we have a Phragmites. I can't remember oh, which yeah. one it is. <laughs> yeah. And we've only got it in, we can even go by there if we want to. Okay. You know, but. I know Phragmites has been a big issue at Cheyenne Bottoms. So okay, like yeah, we've got this, this some we're going to mow this year and then at least yeah. start treating it down river and working our way back where there's one big massive patch and then there's some little stringers coming off of it. Yeah and at least start hitting those and working our way up here. So so this is the Morton County Grazing Association. So okay. we so graze on the grasslands and we have a permit with Morton County and they have a lot of permittees. I couldn't even guess I, the number. But I don't know. But the question we had was, um, how do you balance the, the sort of the, the demand for, for grazing mm -hmm. and stocking rates and stuff with, yep. uh, with not pushing the grassland so hard that you actually start letting stuff move again. Yep, so we have a full-time range management specialist here that they, there you can see, he I think somebody's coming to visit her. <laughs> <laughs> that guy brings the apples. Right? Yeah, right. no, she <laughs> thinks there's another horse friend in that, oh, tra okay. in yeah. Bill's trailer. <laughs> so yeah, we have a rangeland management specialist that works with the grazing association we monitor all the grazing we've got a, a Cimarron allotment management plan where we've said you know here's what we want to have at the end of a grazing season you know whether it's 40 percent or 50 or 60 um, we do a lot of deferred rotational grazing a little bit of rest rotation you know those kind of things so okay. yeah we're this country looks good to me. I haven't been here that long, but I'd been here in the early 90s and it looks better than it did then, Yeah. Okay. you know? So, you know, I think they're doing the right things. We're, we're actually changing some of our grazing. I'm wanting them to do some different things even, you know, they've been real, the Dust Bowl is still the big player in everybody's mind out here. So 
I'm like, okay, what if we do some heavier grazing and then give it longer term rest? What's going to be some benefits, some takeaways from that? So they, have they have they ever done any? So in the Flint Hills, yeah. early intensive is a, a, right. a real common practice. Okay, where you have you go in with a higher stocking rate. And then pull them off awesome. and give them a long, give it that long, long rest, rest period. I'm wanting to do some of that. Okay. We'll see, mainly to see if they'll hit that Russian thistle when it's about that and the kosher, that kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> and you know, we'll, we've got a pasture, we're going to try that on this year because that's about the only thing greening up in this drought. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, how much rain have, you, have they had here, precipitation wise? Since I've been here uh, at Christmas, less than a quarter inch and so since quarter, August I don't think they've had any more than that yeah, yeah that's, and it's currently May as we're filming this yeah May yeah. 9th May 10th much rain. we went on with the cattle yesterday we they're permitted for a little over 5,000 head and we went on with roughly 4,200 and we didn't even do some guys couldn't go on they're having to sell cows already for their private ground oh, wow. but we're already talking about how we're gonna change our rotations and move through stuff quicker and see if it rains and that kind of stuff so it's a weekly process <laughs> yeah, sure. well your your range con is going to definitely earn their keep this year <laughs> yeah he's... trying to trying to manage things because yeah and it's he's... it's going to be a challenge i think and he's a he's young and he's enthusiastic and gung-ho that's it's what you great. want yep he's out of oklahoma state is oh. where he's out okay. of yeah so but yep, this is kind of the epicenter of where the work started in the late 30s and continues today. <laughs> So yeah, they called this the seed shed, and you can see mm -hmm. all of these, they, they just pile seed in here. So and work it but you know pretty historical buildings we manage them as kind of historical we try to keep everything as accurate as we can and still keep them up and usable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know the blacksmith shop next door's falling on hard times but we're going to start working on it too we'll walk over there and take a peek in it too just uh you know, obviously we got to have somewhere to skid loaders and dump trucks and bulldozers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep things out of the weather as best we can. That's the worst. This country, the sun and the wind are tough on things. <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody's like, oh, what do you do? Well, it's, you know, sun is what beats everything up. Just yeah. Seems like UV, if you can get the UV to withstand it then we're good so yeah they just pack this place full of seed well yeah I imagine a lot of it went into these uh-huh because you got your ventilation yep. up there yeah that one and then they'd load it in yeah and of course I wonder if they loaded it from the top they'd have to it opens that yeah, yeah they would load cool. it from the top probably well yep. But still, you know, you have that ventilation so that your seed yep. doesn't get, you yep. know, it, there can be, can't there be, there can be fairly substantial dew some mornings out here. Oh, yeah. Yep. Even this dry year, yep. there's been some. Because I noticed some, I saw a couple of quail guzzlers out there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, that you know, obviously they're there. If it rains, it can catch it. But even just the condensation the will catch some. can yep. catch some of it. No, there's been a number of mornings where there's heavy, heavy dew, and I haven't paid attention to the humidities or the dew points a whole lot except when we were burning but, mm -hmm. you know it how big's your fire crew right now it's two <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll bring on two seasonals in the summer okay yeah so our normal fire crew is yeah two folks and our engines are broke down <laughs> With two summer crews, is that usually like interns? No, they're actually paid seasonals, yeah. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, 
they st actually started yesterday. So, All right. yeah, well, and they're probably already on the board to get shipped somewhere. Yeah. Okay. You know, we're already struggling across the country to get yeah. fill orders, mainly New Mexico, Region 3. But, okay. you know, we're, we went into fire bands on Saturday for campfires and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I see that on the red play warning. Uh, yeah, yesterday well, there was a fire there. over between Satana and Moscow yesterday. Oh, okay, yeah. The yeah. red flag warnings went through the night, the night before last. Mm -hmm. It's only happened one other time that I can remember that they stay in effect clear through the night. Yeah. Usually they're done by 7, 8 at night. Wow. That's from pretty low before humidity. yesterday, yeah. fire, the red flag stayed on. So we're back in it today. Yeah, it never shut off. <laughs> which doesn't happen very often and yeah like say the column you can see to the west is new mexico stuff yeah so do you do you try to do most of your prescribed burns on here in the spring or have you have in they the, done any like late fall summer we're gonna it's all moisture dependent but right, you right. know like this year we'd like to try some in the fall you know that's the big issue is is there enough cover to hold uh, things through the winter so it's not blowing? Right. That's our big right. question. And so we're going to do some small stuff and, and see how it goes. But most, the majority of all the burns have been in the spring. Okay. Yep. We were monitoring soil moistures. You know, we, were, we did our burns this year about the first week of April, last week of March. Okay. And we were checking soil moistures, and there was a little air. I mean, if there's none... But we still didn't get the regrowth we wanted. But there's at least a little, uh -huh. and that's what we're shooting for, is okay. to get that little surge. And so we do a lot of soil moisture checking. And it was low, but it wasn't like, yeah. So what, are you, what do you use to check your moisture? We're just visual, just to okay. see. We're just digging holes to make okay. sure there's something there at all. all. Right. Yeah, and it's... <laughs> that if you can visually see some when you dig the hole, where at least we've got something. There. Okay. Yeah. Because I didn't know if you had so some you know you can use like a tile probe. Right. But and no, we're just this, literally digging a hole. That, and we where's our soil moist? What's our levels at? Is there uh -huh. any there? <laughs> have you get, have you had any resistance from the local community on on using prescribed burns here? Not as much in Kansas as Colorado. The Colorado okay. side heavy persistence against burning. Kansas is, a, they're pretty good. The, you, you know, Jake and the Grazing Association, they they used to be the burn crew. Okay. When we didn't have our own fire folks, that's who you'd call okay. is you'd go get the Grazing Association and the fire department and, you know, do the prescribed burns with them. Okay. So they've been involved with it a lot. And I don't know if it's a different, you know, farmers have a tendency mm. to be a little more okay with burning than just mm. pure ranchers maybe. Mm. I don't know, because, yeah, Colorado's a little more, they're not real big on it, but okay. we're still doing some. I just, you know, everything in the West evolved with fire, so. Well, and, <laughs> I mean, you, you go from, like, the the Flint Hills of Kansas. Yeah. Is, is a I, prime example. The classic of, example, yeah. You know, the, the intermittent fire that swept through the Flint Hills, mm -hmm. you know, those plants evolved to withstand that yep you know where, where the, all of the carbohydrate storage or a lot of it's down you know below yep. the surface yep and so they can basically clean off you know burn it off yep. and then it's you know it'll come back up and and really good lush quality for it. yeah and it is it's amazing and so that's kind of what we're looking at too is what was the reoccurrence of fire here and was it even possible to figure you know we're thinking okay when the you know the vast herds of you know buffalo bison were here mm -hmm. you know they probably took it down to where it wouldn't burn much and then they might be gone for a while and you'd get a flush of growth same thing and then it might have burnt in large chunks you know i doubt if it burned in little you know 800 acre chunks well, like yeah, we're burning yeah. but it it probably burned whole landscapes you know the whole cimarron drainage or something mm -hmm. You know we can't mimic that and i don't know that we would want to with the way things have changed you know right. just human stuff fire so. fire bad yeah the, the european <laughs> mindset of fire bad yeah. yeah and we deal with that a lot before so yeah <laughs> in in our own agency you know we've just been turning the corner on well we've got to 
reintroduce some fire into the systems. Right. Well, and you know, you, I guess it's a little off track of what we are here, but you know, wildfires in, in the Intermountain region. Yeah. And how, if you were to go in and say do some prescribed burning, does that decrease the intensity of yeah. what's going on out yeah. there? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, yeah. You know, and it does have a little, we tie it to that here too, you know, how do we reduce, instead of one big fire across the whole thing, can we have a patchwork of stuff where we can control those fires and manage them mm -hmm. Patch easier, yeah, easier on us, you know, how can we use a burn next to a highway and then if something starts further down the river corridor, because you could easily burn a, 30 miles of this river corridor pretty quick. So that's what we're trying to do is break that up okay. and say, let's have a chunk of it here. So if we do some prescribed burning here and do some targeted grazing here and a bunch of tamarous treatment here, then we've at least got some better management options when it comes to fire. We can, we can say, okay, we get a fire in this section, it's way easier for us to control it here. Instead of maybe even racing and putting it out, we can use this control feature and that use it. Maybe kind of as a back burn type yeah, thing. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. And What's the typical burn frequency? Like, yeah, every, every, that, every few years or just kind of as, as you can? As we can, yeah, it's all weather dependent. We were on the verge this year of not being able to pull it off just with, with you know, the moisture there. levels and the red flag warnings and that kind of stuff. Kansas is easier to burn in than Colorado. We partner with the Comanche grasslands on the Colorado side yeah. for a lot of everything we do. Just because we don't have the people to do some things. So we do okay. most of our stuff together, mm. you know. So we're gonna start writing a grassland plan. You know, if you heard of forest plans and grassland plans, that'll probably start the process next year in 23. Okay. And so we'd like to have that fire incorporated heavily into that, so. And then that'll give us an idea how, we've got 108,000 acres on the Cimarron and I, you know, we haven't burnt 10% of it. Wow. <laughs> a lot of land. Yeah, you know, over the years. So, you know, how do you increase that? And, you know, do we want bigger chunks? Do we want smaller chunks? We've got a lot of things to look at. Our mm -hmm. burns probably only average six, 800 acres, and we'll do three or four of those a year. We're thinking we ought to be at at least 5,000 acres a year we would burn. Okay. You know, that's the, our, our thought right now is five to 8,000 would be for the ecosystem, you know, be the best thing for us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have a lot of personal questions on how do we use burning to help chicken populations, lesser prairie chickens. Yeah. So, has there been any thought of working with like the land grant universities? Yep, they do now. We work with Kansas State, uh, Kansas universities here doing some things. So, you know, we're, we, are, we do work with a lot of them. Okay. Um, I haven't dealt with Oklahoma State much, but Kansas State's probably the one we talk with most on. Okay. Um, you know, uh, like you guys dealing with soils, uh, we're dealing with some recreation type studies mm -hmm. with Kansas State where they're out, they've got cameras on our rec sites and what's our rec use doing. Um, oh. We have a, a, a snake project going on that's mostly Kansas, uh, is it Game and Fish or Parks and Wildlife? Parks and Wildlife. Yeah, they're doing, they're kind of ramrodding that study with one of the universities. Yeah, one of the, uh, well, he was the former department head at K-State, uh, told us we should be watching for rattlesnakes when we went to Pointer Rocks. Oh, yeah, they're, they're out. I just, I got a, took a picture of a snake the other day right in front of the shop, and is it a coral snake and a king snake look similar? Yeah. And it was one of those, and I just haven't looked the picture up yet to see which one it as was. As long as I don't see the triangle head and hear something, yeah, I'm pretty yeah, good. Right. Yeah. yeah, so, and then North Dakota State called, they're doing a, kind of a nationwide soil study. Okay. So they're gonna be doing some soil samples down here this year. Interesting. Yeah, tied to, I think it's tied a lot to CRP and okay. you know, that kind of stuff. So they're gonna be doing some things too. So yeah, there's some things going on. I think, if, you know, the 
fire in the west is the big deal mm -hmm. more with timber type country so most okay. all the fire type stuff centered around that so it'd be neat to get some yeah. Well, I was thinking fire. there's a gentleman over at Kansas State. He's not young anymore, but probably knows more about burning than <laughs> yeah. anyone alive. Yeah. Dr. Owensby. Yeah. Yeah, Owensby and Dr. Pick. Yeah, they yeah. would. They would be. It would be interesting to hear their opinions yeah. on uh -huh. frequency and. It would. And, and part of it, I guess, your challenge. It's just not from the production for livestock. No. It's ecosystem services. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what that's really the mission of this grassland, is right. it not? Yeah, that's our, we're a multiplier, multiple resource agency. Right. So, and so how do we manage for literally yeah. everything we can think of from, yeah. and people don't think of soil is where it kind of starts. Soil and water is yeah. kind of the beginning of that. Yeah. Well, then vegetation and then, okay, wildlife and then cattle and then people you know mm -hmm. recreation and then we have a lot of oil and gas here as well so that was what surprised me <laughs> driving through here yesterday yeah was the amount of yeah there's a lot of, it's it's an older field so it's slowing down a lot yeah well i noticed there weren't still, a lot of pump jets yeah no they, it's kind of starting you know with everything going on right now mm -hmm. it's made a slight uptick but not what i expected to be honest yeah so. i was <clears throat> i definitely noticed that yesterday when we were you know taking that yeah Auto tour, tour right? around, yeah. You know, there's wow, there's a lot <laughs> there's of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of right oil and gas production, right? So, <coughs> so oh, we we stopped at the Middle Springs yesterday, mm -hmm. and <coughs> excuse me, is that pretty much run continuously? Does it seasonally go dry, or is it no? It, and I'm not real familiar with the history, but what they're telling me is it does seasonally go dry, usually when they turn the circle pivots <coughs> on above it. <laughs> well, that's not so <laughs> That seems Shrink to have, have pull the, that water level that's down. the greatest effect to it. Because, yeah, it's still got pretty good water in well, it right it was, now. Um, we were there yesterday, and there was a bunch of tumbleweeds in it. Yeah. But you could see water. Standing there. water, yeah. There's yeah. a couple of patches through there, you know. And I'm curious, and some of my other questions were, you know, we have... 20 some miles of the Santa Fe Trail that came through here on the Cimarron cutoff, mm -hmm. you know, and how heavy it was used. I'll bet that place was so pounded. I'll bet there wasn't a tree. Everything was grazed, browsed, yeah. beat down because you had people there every day, yeah. you know, on big and everybody was extractive at that right. point in human history. So between firewood and oxen and mules and horses and cows and people, you know, I just can't imagine it looked like it does now. I And we fenced it off. And, of course, we don't graze or do anything in there. And I'm wondering if we should be. Because nature likes disturbance, whether it's fire or grazing. You know, they don't like it. Nature doesn't like long-term disturbance. Right. But short-term disturbance, it usually reacts fairly well. Yeah. So. I noticed the placard talked about, there, there's a quote from someone that had walked through there and, we're talking about how muddy the water was. I imagine that was just because there's so many people using it. Yeah, it just, it just that. I think it was just, yeah. the use there was way more then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's one of the neater little spots on the grassland, yeah. you know, and, you know, just from a wildlife standpoint, everything, there's been elk tracks there, uh, bumped a bunch of quail. There's been a great horned owl nesting in there. Uh, I got a little skunk buddy, I go, take a little walk around there at least a couple times a week and he says hi and we mm -hmm. leave each other alone <laughs> yeah. yeah if they get puffy you want to double yeah, just right. move away I'm, yeah. I'm just way before the tail comes up right. you better yeah but those are some of the things you know some of those willows are old and decadent actually and i'm like should they be removed or yeah not? do i take a bulldozer and just kind of run it over should we just dump a whole bunch of cows in there like as many as i can get for two, three days, just mm -hmm. real short term. Like kind of flash grazing yeah, type system? Yeah, uh-huh. You know, super heavy though. How do I, can I take every cow over there and just dump them in there for, even if it's a day with 200 head or something? Mm -hmm. um, do we burn it? You know, it's still, you know, there's a huge recreation value there so that we have to consider too. So. Well, and you've got some improvements there. Yeah. You know, the little <laughs> yeah. bridge going across that you yeah. have to so, think about. The bridge in the bathroom? Like, uh-huh. Yeah, that's the whole. Have a fire get away and yeah and that's that's been our mission from day one not i mean our mission originally was forest and trees and then fire and then 
kind of everything. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's how do we manage all these resources at the same time? And we succeed, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. I mean, there's some issues we've had and we're learning all the time, but you know, how do we manage all these different resources that are being stressed higher all the time? Not, I mean, obviously from weather this year and drought, you know, to the recreation use is increasing across the country and everybody doesn't consider us a big recreation dis destination. It's shocking the amount of people really? that are, we're on the big bird watch list. So, you know, our campgrounds got people in it every day. You know, and those fishing ponds they created, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a unique little system in for southwest Kansas. So, yeah. you know, how do we manage that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, I was kind of wondering about that because it seems like it's off the radar in terms of uh, yeah. you know, like the regular places you would, yeah. you would like make a trip somewhere to go to. Yeah, but. so we get a lot of fire crews come in to help us burn or like right now we're on fire severity. So yeah. we've got crews from southern Colorado from the city of Aurora outside of Denver. Okay. They're out down here helping us just kind of as a patrol and helping with it. And they go, we didn't know this was here. We're going to bring our families and come down here and uh, either... Yeah, we're going to either come down and camp and hike or, you know, bring our motorcycle ATV and go yeah. prowl around, that kind of stuff. Yeah, because it could be this year's tough, just as dry as it is, but you know, in a normal spring when all the sand sage is green and everything's coming up, it's pretty spectacular country. Well, and I'm and what's I think is really interesting about this region is what happens right after a rain. Oh yeah. <laughs> so in the you know in the in the the spring and summer, yeah, the wildflowers oh, after yeah. a rain, uh, just it's amazing at times. Yeah, and that's. You know, all this country's kind of adapted to that. There isn't a, the window isn't very big. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, okay, you get this spring moisture, great. But, you know, you'll get even more if the monsoon sets up and kind of trickles that mm -hmm. big for this country. Right. So, you know, all that stuff will bloom, yeah, late July. All, yeah. When you'd think, well, everything's kind of went through its cycle. Maybe the warm seasons, grasses are still going. But then you get a, quarter inch rain and <laughs> those plants have adapted to it you're right and yeah just, and then just, they're waiting for that opportunity <laughs> yeah the, the the reproductive will of native plants <laughs> yeah. is really amazing yeah yeah we're seeing that when we change our grazing systems you know we'll see these plant species that nobody's seen they're native but they just haven't been here mm -hmm, either yeah. they were plowed under because most of the country was yeah and then we reintroduced all this stuff and planted it and then boy we nobody's seen this species of grass and it might have been sitting there waiting for 30 years to just go oh now's our opportune time so yeah, <laughs> yeah i mean well and, and the forbes and you know and yeah then, you know so maybe possibly the forbes were just due to um, grazing management yeah. potentially mm -hmm. And, you know, I think something that people don't understand is there are a lot of forbs that livestock like to eat. Oh, they, those mules, yeah. I can't go buy a sand sage plant when it just leafs out mm -hmm. and then mules are just, they're thumping yeah, it. I yeah. I, so I'm sure everything's utilizing certain things. And, you know, everybody was, you know, our knowledge increases luckily. So, you know, forbs weren't an important part of the system well it turns out they're probably highly important they aren't they are yeah and not only to to herbivores you know cows horses whatever but you get nectaring insects yeah and that kicks over into back to our lesser prairie chickens and you, you know, know all those things what kind of migratory birds are coming through here what they're keying on uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the Sandhill Plum was named the official state tree or official state fruit of Kansas. Okay, and there's some so, big exactly. patches of sand plum yeah, down yeah, here. I was yeah. wondering about that. Kansas yeah. Parks and Wildlife. You know, we introduced a lot of species across the West. You know, yeah. tamarisk, Russian olive, because they grew good, and it was like, oh, this is going to save us. Yeah. And and it probably was beneficial for a minute. Yeah. 
you know, and now if we've got these systems up kind of half function, we're like, man, that wasn't the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> so we're trying to get more native like Sand Plum. Kansas Parks and Wildlife is doing a lot of work with how do we get these sand plums established because it's hard you know in this type of climate well, this getting is, them this... initially going <laughs> I was talking with a guy from the Kansas Forest Service and just asking them with their conservation trees if they're going to see an uptick in, in orders for sand hill plums and they figured there probably would be <laughs> yeah. uh, now that it's been the, the digital the, state fruit so yeah right that should be interesting. that's yeah, I, most of the locals around here it's a big deal to come out if there's a sand plum crop they're out. Everybody's got their little patch of sand plums on the grassland, and they're out yeah. picking and ready making to jelly. Make jelly. <laughs> yeah. 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 So just another use that the grasslands have. Yeah. Well, and I guess it goes back to you know the the Forest Service mission is is Forest Service is a multi use agency. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's part of your mission that yeah. to, to do these kinds of yep. things. So, and and we're learning all the time, and you know just science and culture and everything changes and how do you adapt with it and still keep your land and these ecosystems intact and functioning you know yep. just as you know with this drought it's you know we learn a lot through drought you know we've had some major major droughts starting in 02 and you know things aren't falling apart at least in my mind you know i mean we're at least holding things together and we're still able to do all those things we've talked about mm -hmm. you know managing for wildlife and yeah. bird species and and still be able to graze cattle and do some oil and gas and that's good yeah so I'm it's sure fun. not an easy task to, to manage so many <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so many stakeholders and so many resources. Yeah, but it's but, that's kind of the fun part about it. It's something different every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I go back to, to some of the economics of it. It's the allocation of scarce resources yeah, amongst right. competing wants and needs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Both on a human level mm -hmm. and a <laughs> and system a, level. Yeah. 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 What plant wins the water battle and the reproduction battle, yeah. So, yeah, it's dang sure enjoyable. Should we go check out a few other sites? <laughs> sure. All right. All right. So, yeah, this was the old blacksmith shop when we were doing the major restoration work. So this is probably where they were repaired all the equipment that they had out here and probably had to hand make it as we were talking about, you know, Mm -hmm. During the depression, they couldn't get it, so they'd have to make stuff. But they make their own parts. This was the forge over here in the corner, you know, where they. And there might have been another one right there. Wouldn't you yeah. get? Yeah, that's like, well, look, there. Here. That's yeah. So here's your yeah, either coal or your heat charcoal source, or yeah. whatever they used, and then you can see where the fire brick came out. Yeah. Would have come around. There's the old bellows. There's the right old there. bellows are still yeah. hanging in there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's, yeah, that is. Yeah, you got so, a little water leakage. It is, and that's on our list. We need to really make some investment into Tunerville. And what this is, we're looking at it. It'd make a nice saw shop for our fire crews. Yeah. You know, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, well, one so, thing I think is neat is like, yeah, these buildings are still, still being used to conserve the grasslands. It's yeah. just a. Uh, uh, slightly different mission now, but yeah. it's still still more or less the same mission. No, we're still using them, still trying to manage some ground for both people and the resource. Yeah, pretty cool. So, yeah, we've got some work to do in here, but that is the plan. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, they did a lot of stream stabilization along the Cimarron, you know, people are always trying to think, how can we make the environment work for us? <laughs> we were just talking about that. <laughs> and you're kind of like, okay, it can work for you, but there's some parameters here. So when steam tractors went away, they used them to stabilize a lot of river banks. Like we were talking, you know, you see spots where they did it with old cars too, but when they were rebuilding the bridge, they found this one and kind of cleaned it up. And <laughs> so, 
you know, and I don't know what year this machine would have been, yeah, it's a, 1907. So, you know, they were probably starting to farm this country pretty hard then. Um, but, you know, in that day and age, things were advancing so fast that, you know, these things probably weren't around very long. <laughs> So, but yeah, it says with the adaption of gasoline or kerosene engines to tractors in the 20s, steam engines became obsolete. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they weren't really used in the, you know, the work the Soil Conservation Service and the Forest Service was doing out here, but still a unique part of history. <laughs> That, that's just another thing we in the Forest Service do, you know, is what cultures were here, what were they doing, how are things, you know, like we do some stuff, uh, the Kiowa and Comanche tribes were probably the, the last ones that were here, you know, mm -hmm. mostly, so, you know. Before that, there was probably Folsom, clear back to Folsom, who knows, but, well, yeah, it's... but you know, obviously, the Kiowa and Comanche were the last ones here. Mm -hmm. And they were probably pretty seasonal. I mean, there wouldn't be a whole lot of reason to be right here this year. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a well, normal I mean, you know, spring they're... maybe, but, you know, this year with a drought, you know, they were able to move and follow not only buffalo, but just the weather, you know, <laughs> which was all tied together. Mm -hmm. Go check out this other tractor. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we when we do projects, we have to follow NEPA, the National Environmental Policy oh, yeah. Act. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So and you know, Arcola archaeologically you know we look at a lot of different things historically culturally Have how are we affecting those resources you know when we do a prescribed burn or when we do an oil and gas project we want to look at you know the effects those things are going to have on just a wide variety of resources did they ever find any tp rings out here not that i know of i'm sure they were around you know because of course they're probably all blown over or gone now mm -hmm. just with the dust bowl right. plowed under I'm, I'm sure they were here you know like as, as important as middle springs was to the santa fe trail you know it was just as important before that yeah in so, prehistory yeah so i'm sure they were they were around that quite a bit no doubt and you, you know you don't know what was this did the cimarron run more often less often what mm -hmm. You know, it's still running. It's just mm. below the ground. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's <clears throat> evidenced by the pit ponds. Yeah. You know, those dugouts are... Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was here back in the, the late 80s, I was amazed the first time I came over here. And they said, well, you can go fishing over on the grasslands. And <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that water that water is just down below the surface. Yeah. 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 So things tap into it. Tamarisk has done well. <laughs> well they, they Which, you know, you look here, and we've done a lot of tamarisk work here, so, you know, you don't see it as prominent here, but you're mm -hmm. seeing it pop up. I mean, I don't know if you guys, what we want to go look at next. We can go look at burns, or we can go look at some major, you went through that tamarisk. When you crossed the river at that end, mm -hmm. right as you crossed it, it thick tamarisk, and then none. It's yeah. a real distinct what we've done there with tamarisk although this is an area we've done some work with too do you know of any uh like old like farmstead like foundations or they're just all like that? pretty much gone i oh, went okay, out and yeah. prowled around when we were talking the other day mm -hmm. i went and uh, looked for them they've all just yeah been and then there was what usually gave them away was a tree there yeah. was still a oh, tree yeah. <laughs> Well, just since 02, those trees have just taken such a beating with drought that you can't hardly find anything oh, wow. left. Yeah. I, I couldn't find a foundation the other day. 
it, not that it was probably from then. I mean, there's mm -hmm. some from like probably the 50s. Yeah. In some cases, it would have been sod houses that wouldn't have had a foundation. Uh -huh, so, right. Yeah. yeah. It's hard so. to say. Went, then you're just looking for a hole in the ground. Somewhere. Right. And then, you know, I would say, you know, this land was so productive with wheat. That's why they were here. I mean, they were just, everybody could grow that wheat. And I think it was a, a winter wheat from like the steppes of Russia, Ukraine, that part of the country. It might have been the old Turkey Red. Yeah. Yeah, Turkey Red. That's, yeah. I mean, for a while you couldn't farm out here because it was so, so much, so dry, dry. or so much, yeah, so much more dry. Yeah. And uh, once the, the Germans from the Russian steppe came out with the, the Turkey Red, <laughs> that, that opened up like what would have all been grassland. So. Yeah. And they did. They plowed it all. I mean, you know, basically everything you're looking at on the grasslands was in private ownership and probably farmed. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and you know, that just that moisture cycle, they hit a good point and everybody made a lot of money. I mean, these little towns were big towns. They all had car dealerships and tractor dealerships and movie theaters and, you know, every little town, Richfield and Rollins. Yeah. Town card, you know, Richfield was the county seat for a while. It wouldn't shock me if Rolla had been. I don't know that, but I know Richfield was. Richfield was a pretty big town, mm. and there's not much left in Richfield. So neat spot, different kind. You know, this side of the river, like we were talking about, we call it the sandy soil side. Mm -hmm. And then as you're looking over there, it's on the other, the north side of the rivers. We just call it a little tighter. It's you know more short grass prairie, yeah. Or this side sand sage dominated type of ecosystems. So All the we, silt that would have been here is now over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we manage them like that right now. We've kind of split it up. And say okay, we have a short grass ecosystem, a riparian ecosystem, and a sand sage ecosystem. Yeah, I was reading that in the app. That was kind of okay. interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of and you know who says as we learn more. We may change our mind again, you know, because we didn't do that up until probably the early 2000s. We said, oh, let's manage these as those distinct ecosystems, mm. you know. So when we're doing things with uh, grazing and anything, anything we're doing out here, we kind of, what are we shooting for? Because I don't know, is that what we want? Is the sand sage? Is that the most productive for uh, the ecosystem and for what, you know, as we're thinking as people, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we got to consider. <laughs> I mean, right now, at least it's stable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the big thing. So yeah, this is a prescribed fire we called uh, low crossing. We burnt a little over a month ago. So I'm trying to reintroduce fire. Um, normal year, it'd be even way better than this. So, you know, our response just because of the dry isn't what we think we would like. But uh, how did this country burn in the past? I'll bet it burned when it was really dry. I <laughs> just that's probably just guessing. I suppose it did all kinds of different things, you know. Yeah, especially with either dry lightning or yeah. or even before uh, before pioneers. Yeah. The, I'm sure the natives would have used it to yeah. grow fresh grass and attract yeah. the bison here. This is where every critter in the country shows up. I mean, they're here before the smoke leaves. Yeah. Turkeys were piling in here. White-tailed deer, the elk are finding it. I mean nature likes fire yeah you well, know on a certain extent <laughs> it's it's like you said n nature likes short disturbance yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. It, not 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 the massive tillage and wind erosion that went on that kind of yielded this area as it sits now yeah but the removal of the old growth and stimulation of new growth and you know animals of all types, right. being able to come out and forage and, and yep. get what they need to eat. Yeah, and like I say, this side, the soil's different on this side of the river than the other side. Mm -hmm. It's just, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things, you know, like what are the effects on yucca? Obviously it didn't kill it, 
Mm -hmm. You know, how prevalent was yucca in this ecosystem? How prevalent do we want it? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. I mean, you know, you'd see a yucca bloom and it just loved it, that one over there. Yeah. It's going, ooh, we're gonna make a bloom. <laughs> it's so dry lately that I'm just surprised at that. But obviously it, it's either a response yeah. to, uh-oh, we're gonna die, or, but then you see, a fresh bloom like this yeah <laughs> you know is it responded to thinking it's going to die or is it just liking the conditions who knows yeah. i mean i don't somebody does you know this one almost looks like it's been browsed <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it was obviously burnt but you know so is it does something like that you know you look across here at the riparian system and we've turned the cows in there the other day just to see if they'll hit this Russian thistle kosher. I'm not sure what it is here exactly. You know, that's they'll hit that. Mm -hmm. And it's highly, highly palatable and nutritious at that stage. It gets a little taller and they don't want it. Yeah. And it can, excuse me, take over, you know, country. It kind of, yeah, a little more than we'd want to see. So right now we're doing some things with the cattle in here to see if they can kind of inhibit the growth of that by hitting those forbs when they're more palatable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're. It, it's the big question is how much fire do we want to reintroduce? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions, but. Uh, we got to keep trying, and like I say, this burn was about 800 acres, so sometimes I think, well, we can try something, and if we screw it up, it's 800 acres, not 108,000 acres. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. here, obviously, our grasses are still doing fine. There's a little, they're starting to cure on the ends. They're wanting a drink pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But it's here. Usually, you see a lot of insect kind of bump with the heat um, I, maybe that's why all the turkeys were in here they were they're just all over in here oh really they loved it yeah. <laughs> yeah well and I wonder so on chickens where those newly hatched chicks yeah. have to have soft-bodied insects right is there is there something that's missing in the management yeah. or you know is there something going on where that that's not what they they're not getting, getting at? yeah because i don't think if you know we've done a lot of cover stuff and changed the grazing systems and and just have a lot more cover of all varieties but is it the right mix of grasses forbs shrubs is it too much too little i you know nothing everything seems to like some kind of edge <laughs> I, you know, so, okay, so we have a piece of burned with a piece of unburned with a piece of something else. I think that's probably more of what we're looking for mm -hmm. is just that we don't want that, what is the word, heterogeneity? Is yeah. that the right word? Yep. You know, across the whole 108,000 acres. That's just not what I think we want. I think we want that mix of things. Mm -hmm. um, you can see over here that the stuff that burnt real hot yeah. That's a patch of tamarisk. Tamarisk burns really, really well. <laughs> tamarisk also really, really, really likes fire. Yeah. So you're going to see a big, huge influx in there. So we are going to treat the tamarisk in this patch. Okay. When it comes back up, probably late in the year when it does that kind of fall surge. And hopefully we'll chemically treat it and it'll be pretty effective. So we're looking at a whole group of things in here, you know, because just trying to do the right thing. So you mentioned prairie chickens and turkeys. Uh, is, is hunting allowed on the grasslands? It is. Yep. Yeah. Um, not prairie chickens. Not yeah, prairie, okay. lesser prairie chick Lesser prairie chickens. Mm -hmm. They have. Uh, they'd hunted them for a lot of years, but since the population, we're looking. You know, it's it's always in a debate whether to put it on the threatened list. Yeah. Um, it was put on. It was taken off. It's being talked about putting back on now. So mm -hmm. we'll see how that affects our management. A lot of questions around prairie chicken. They seem to be moving. We did find a few lex this spring. We do pretty major 
lesser prairie chicken surveys mm -hmm. in the spring. Um, used to be the number one spot for them. It's not now. They've moved north. Mm -hmm. Why is that? <laughs> I just, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are the effects of CRP farming? They, you know, they're, we're learning a lot. You know, they seem to use both. You know, a lot of the locals say when they quit growing milo around here is when the prairie chickens started dropping. Oh, and the, the prairie chickens made it when this country was all dirt, just blowing dirt and sand. So yeah, <laughs> it is not currently that. So what is it that is affecting them? That's I think a big, big question. You know, we've well, it's the oil and gas with the vertical structure. Well, that's been here. The chickens were thriving when that was really booming in the late seventies, early eighties. Huge prairie chicken population. Yeah. Is it the grazing? We've changed up grazing systems and we actually have learned a lot, you know, and we think we're leaving a lot more cover and forbs and grasses. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't seem to have affected the, they just still continue to kind of trend down. So, so that's what we're trying to do different things. Okay, maybe we graze something early and heavy. And then like Tom and I were talking, give it a long-term rest. Maybe we don't graze a pasture. We try to, create a mix of different things. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but we're trying. And as we do our grassland plan, I have a feeling the prairie chicken will be a major player in that, how we manage for it. So I think there's more questions than answers. <laughs> yeah. Well, we saw some mule deer yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, and then you, also, you mentioned there's elk too. Uh, how big is the elk population here? It's varied up and down. It, they're okay. still around. They kind of hang more towards the upper end of the grasslands on the Colorado, Oklahoma, line they're more oh, okay. over there okay um so it's, it went from anywhere from 30 to like 180 head i don't know currently okay. they did a lot of radio collar and that kind of stuff back in the 90s mm -hmm. and now they don't manage for them in any of the three states near as much yeah. um you know oklahoma and texas and and colorado you could pretty much shoot them yeah. <laughs> so you know they do but and i haven't seen them in a long time but i see signs and tracks and stuff regularly so yeah. they've adapted uh, you know and they might have been this is probably where they were all the time yeah so and they know how to avoid people yeah. <laughs> and there's some spots on the grassland that don't see people ever <laughs> you know, so those elk darn sure know where that those spots are. But I, this may be a little further down the river for them to find. I don't know. I haven't. They're usually up there around Point of Rocks and the state line, that country there. Okay. Yeah. Usually where you see them. So, so yep. Yeah, but yeah, prescribed fire is becoming a more and more important tool and how we use it and what its effects. We're going to forest wide we're combined the whole forest is the pike san isabel cimarron and comanche mm -hmm. we're combined under one administrative unit out of the pueblo office and then we split up into ranger districts so the cimarron's its own separate ranger district i see but we're looking at hiring more fire planners uh fire ecologists that kind of thing and mm -hmm. how does what kind of role does fire play and you know, how do we put it back on the landscape in the right way, that kind of stuff. Does the Forest Service have any soil scientists that are like stationed in this? We uh, have one. In that management district, one? Okay. <laughs> in Pueblo. Pueblo, okay. You yeah. know, so right now it, just, it varies, you know, so you think a soil scientist would be pretty important now that you and I are sitting here talking. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, it <laughs> well, I know the Forest Service has a, a they've, they've been hiring a lot of soil scientists recently. Yeah, so. we're... We're hiring a lot of a things. This part of the country, of we're hiring fire and our recreation people. Yeah. But we're struggling to get people to come to Elkhart. It's kind of funny. Yeah. So. I mean, it's a cool landscape. I mean. It is. <laughs> if you don't mind wind, it, <laughs> yeah. it would be, it would definitely be an interesting place to be for a while. Yeah. Well, and then, yeah, the Forest Service, you know, you do have the opportunity of moving anywhere in the country. Yeah. You know, so. But the, the grasslands are truly unique. So in terms of like, uh, just for hiring uh, students out of college, oh. like, well, what's your, what's your biggest demand right now? Like, so you mentioned like range, ma uh, range range management people. We couldn't fill a range management job the other day. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, we're flying range management jobs all the time. Yeah. And we need to do a better uh, outreach. <laughs> okay. 
because uh, we've had good luck with Oklahoma State. Colorado State's, their uh, range program has dropped off. Mm -hmm. So how do we tie in with Kansas State? That's a big question. Yeah. Archaeology, we just hired four archaeologists. Oh, really? For the whole forest, yeah. So okay. there's a huge demand right now in the Forest Service for those jobs. And yeah. We're not filling them. We, we're not getting the people, actually. And uh, grasslands in particular, but mm -hmm. people think Forest Service, they think, you know, mountains and trees and forests. And, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the problem with names of agencies is yeah, yeah. There's, there's usually a bigger bigger mission than, than what it can fit in a yeah, couple of words. So, right, yeah. yeah, no, the national grasslands are a major, major component of our system, so. Yeah. And we, like that, how do we, what, it's gonna change. I mean, you know, right now it's fire and recreation are the two big things that are coming up with us. Yeah. But there's always range, there's always soil, there's always water. You know, and that um, we hire everything through USA Jobs, yep. and there's something on there all the time, all yep. the time. Okay. 